NASA astronauts left 12 camera bodies on the surface of the moon during the Apollo missions between the years of 1969 and 1972, and it was all premeditated. <gasps> in 1962, we know NASA was in dire need to have a high-quality camera to capture photos of their space missions. John Glenn had just successfully orbited the Earth three times, in which he was able to grab the first-ever human-captured images of the Earth with his $40 Frankenstein drugstore camera. Let me introduce you to Walter Shira, who during the same year said, Johnny Glenn? Hold my beer. As he walked into a completely different drugstore down in Houston and purchased a $500 Hasselblad 500C camera with a planar 80mm f2.8 lens on the advice of photographers from Life Magazine and National Geographic. Now, Shira was way more of a shutterbug and photo enthusiast than John Glenn was, and Shira was also preparing for his Mercury 8 mission. I think it's quite cool that, once again, we see how these NASA astronauts were so involved in their missions. As far as I can tell, no one is telling them, no one at NASA is saying, go out and buy some cameras for these missions. They are just going out and buying cameras just for themselves because they know they're going to be part of history. They're going on a space travel and they want to document this, at least for their sake. It was Shira who introduced NASA to the Hasselblad cameras. And here's another fun fact. Hasselblad had no idea any of this was going on and they wouldn't find out for at least another three years, which we'll get to here shortly. Anyway, Shira brings his shiny new camera back to NASA and they immediately loved what they saw. So much so that they actually went out and purchased their own Hasselblad. And after that, NASA engineers got to work just as they did with John Glenn's camera as the cameras needed to be as light as possible and also survive the harsh conditions of space, with temperatures ranging from 250 degrees Fahrenheit in direct sunlight all the way to minus 85 degrees Fahrenheit in the shade. Here are the modifications that NASA did for Shira's Hasselblad. NASA removed its leather covering, auxiliary shutter, reflex mirror, and viewfinder to make it lighter for the mission. NASA did add a side viewfinder to make it easy to use in tight spaces while wearing a helmet. A new film magazine was constructed to allow for 70 exposures instead of the 12 that you would typically get with medium format. And yes, this is a good time to point this out. The Hasselblad is a medium format camera versus John Glenn's 35mm format camera. So instead of 36 frames that you get on 35mm, with the 6x6 huge negative size of medium format, you only got 12 exposures. Here's the difference between the size in 35mm film and 6x6 medium format film. Dare I say it that we are taking one large step for mankind here. I said it. Dad joke. Let's get on with it. Finally, NASA painted the outside of the camera matte black to cut down reflections inside the orbiter. Because as we all know, if you're trying to shoot out a window, you typically get reflections unless there's something dark to obscure that. The Mercury 8 mission with Walter Shira was just the starting point for NASA and Hasselblad. NASA would continue to use these Hasselblad cameras in future missions unbeknownst to Hasselblad, which is... Once again, bonkers to me. That was until three years later. In 1965, during the Gemini 4 mission, the Hasselblad camera was there when Ed White performed his famous spacewalk. When the stunning images were finally released to the public, the Swedish camera company finally put two and two together and said, hey, I think these photos were taken with our camera. And this is mind boggling to me because no one at NASA even thought to pick up the phone and say, hey, Help us out with this. What should we be doing? How can we make this better? No. Once again, it was the astronauts going out, getting these cameras, and then NASA engineers just engineering the shit out of it so that they can use it in space. But it was Hasselblad that reached out immediately once they put two and two together to see if there's any way that they could help out. Even in 1965, it would seem that NASA's priorities lie in the scientific realm, and photography is just an afterthought. Because quite frankly, I would have thought that they would have reached out to Hasselblad first to make a camera that would fit their needs. I guess maybe it's a pride thing. I could see NASA engineers being like, nope, nope, we got this. We don't need anything. Just, we'll just Frankenstein the shit out of this. <laughs> Long story short, this was the beginning of a beautiful relationship between NASA and Hasselblad, and one that gave us some of the most iconic images of the last century, including Earthrise, a photo taken by astronaut Bill Anders from the command module of Apollo 8 on Christmas Eve, 1968. And it was this beautiful relationship between NASA and Hasselblad that would ultimately put 12 cameras to their final resting spot on the surface of the moon. By the time the Apollo missions had rolled around, Hasselblad and NASA had been working hand-in-hand -hand to develop the Hasselblad 500EL, a new and improved camera for your space travel. The 500EL was a camera that was suited for long flight durations and the hostile lunar environment. Hasselblad built a custom high-capacity film holder, and then Kodak stepped in and produced a film that had a thinner emulsion layer. This combination resulted in being able to shoot hundreds of photos on one film back. Imagine being able to shoot 160 color photos or 200 black and white photos on one film back without having to change anything. A Zeiss Biogon 60mm f5.6 lens was the lens of choice to document the lunar surface, and thus, 
was strapped, or rather mounted, to Neil Armstrong's chest. This lens was specifically made and engineered and designed for NASA for this specific need, but it would be later available to the public. So if you're like me and you like history and you like photography and all this crazy stuff, you could go out and buy a Hasselblad 500 series camera and then go out and buy the Zeiss 60 millimeter lens and you would have a part of history here. No one else would know it, but you would know that this combination of lens and camera went to the moon. As with Glenn's camera, there are modifications made here too. The shutter button and other controls on the camera were made larger for ease of use while the astronauts were in their thick protective gloves and moon suits. And the astronauts were given suggested exposure settings for a variety of scenarios. There were electric motors inside the Hasselblad 500EL, which greatly automated the lunar photography. The astronauts still had to set shutter speed, aperture, and distance, or focus as we know it. When the shutter was finally released, the exposure would happen and the electric motors within the camera would advance to the next frame. So to set the shutter speed, aperture, and focus, or distance, there were special levers that were designed and attached to this camera. Once again, this made everything easy to use with these bulky gloves. There was also this thing called a resoplate. Now, if you don't know what a resoplate plate is, that was just a plate that was placed close to the film plane and had these cross marks on it. And these cross marks are famous in any of the lunar photos that you see, but they serve two main purposes. One, they allowed for correcting film distortions, and two, it helped judge distance and measure things in these photos. These cross marks were calibrated to within two thousandths of a millimeter, and that's how they could accurately measure and judge distances while on the moon, because there were no landmarks, if you will, on the moon. And finally, a special lubricant was produced that could withstand the huge temperature swings on the lunar surface. Like the earliest Hasselblads on the Mercury flights, the data camera lacked a conventional viewfinder. Instead, astronauts went through training here on Earth to learn how to aim the camera by feel from chest level, as that's where the camera was attached to. On July 20th, 1969, the Apollo 11 lunar module landed with two cameras, but only one went outside, and it was carried by Neil Armstrong. This explains why nearly every photograph that we have from that mission is of Buzz Aldrin. Neil Armstrong had the only camera for nearly the entire two and a half hours that the two walked around the Sea of Tranquility. An official NASA document actually describes how the space agency's public affairs department had to scramble to satisfy the world's media for photos of the historic moonwalk, and they suddenly discovered an embarrassing oversight. They started looking for the best shot of Armstrong. According to a transcript, soon they were looking for any shot of Armstrong. Aldrin, who was busy setting up lunar experiments, did briefly take over the camera and remarkably snapped only a single photo of Armstrong. Later missions that involved longer walks on the surface of the moon also allowed for more photography time. In and each astronaut actually had their own camera strapped to their chest. However, this led to NASA actually having a hard time to distinguish the two astronauts because everyone's wearing the same spacesuit and everyone's got a camera strapped to their chest. So much so that a red stripe was added to the commander's suit at the arms, legs, and helmet. In total, thousands of pictures came back from the surface of the moon during these six missions, and most of them had been taken with the Hasselblads. But NASA was nervous about having enough fuel to get off the moon and back to the orbiting command module. So instead of loading up the Hasselblad cameras and lenses, they opted, forget this, moon rocks instead. This kills me as a photographer, but I think I get it. Obviously, you go into the moon, you want to bring back something to study and everything, but couldn't you bring back that five pounds of camera gear? I mean, come on. So they opted for the space rocks, and they tossed those beautiful, one-of-a-kind, unique Hasselblads and their lenses to their final resting spots on the moon. And that is where they remain today, untouched, at the six Apollo landing sites. If you want to take a look at the thousands of photos from the Apollo missions, I've included a link in the description, and it's actually kind of wild. It's well-organized, and it's really cool to click through these and look back on history. I've spent like three or four hours one night just getting lost in these frames, these old frames, film cameras that we sent to the moon and have really really left their mark on history. There's a lot of photos, but it's fascinating. Go take a look for yourself. If you like all things photography like I do, then go ahead and join the community we're growing here on YouTube by subscribing down below. And as always, if you have any feedback, comments, questions, concerns, or corrections, leave them in the comments below. I do read them all. Peace out, and until next time, I'll see you guys later. Oh, that was a long one. Lots of history. Lots of history. I think that's it, though. We're good, right?